All that said, I need to be done and we need to welcome our friend up here. Many of you know Pastor Ben Dixon. He is currently the pastor at Northwest Church in Federal Way. It's a wonderful Foursquare church. If you're ever up for traveling south on a Saturday night, they have a Saturday evening service. Pastor Ben is one of my dearest friends. He is as dear to my heart as any friend I have. He was our associate pastor for eight years, but prior to that, he was serving in so many ways. He and his wife, after marrying, made this place home. Their son, Isaiah, was our youth pastor for around seven years, now on their team. We know and love Ben and Bridget. They are just dear to this house. Yeah, I, yeah. Author of many books, just altogether one of the best men I know. I love and respect him. I would follow him anywhere. Would you welcome Pastor Ben Dixon? Hey, good morning, Pastor Chris. I don't even know how to follow that introduction. I could listen to you all day, I'll tell you what. The way you minister, I miss, I miss you. I miss you guys. Um, Hey, it is, uh, it is an honor. Are we good? Is the le volume level good? Just don't yell at you. Is that what you're trying to tell me today? Okay. Well, I'm so glad to be here. It's an honor uh, to share this time with you and to open the word today. Um, I first just want to say thanks to Pastor Chris and Jen for having me here. And they, they are very special to us. I don't, I don't want to belabor that and, and talk about it too much, but it's hard to say what they mean to us, honestly. And uh, so many of you, too, the staff here and so many people, I recognize you. Some of you, I don't. It's, my name's Ben. What's your name? One, two, three. That was a great introduction. We did good. We did good there. But uh, it's been two years since I had the privilege of sharing the word with you. And uh, I'm, always, I'm always honored to, to open the Bible, but also be here. This is a very special place. So many things have happened here in the life of our family. My wife is with me, Bridget, and I'm so glad she usually doesn't get to come with me whenever I go and speak somewhere, but this is a very special place to us, so uh, she, she came with me today. And I, I did want you to know that in case you have no clue who we are, that's completely fine. I am Isaiah's dad. Okay, that helps. I'm Isaiah's dad. And uh, if, it's a, if you're a little salty because he moved from here to, uh, to our place, uh, they're doing well, and they're making Bridget and I grandparents here in just a few weeks. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, 43 years old, going to be grandpa. And I told him, no weird names. I don't want, you know, papa, pee-pee, pee -pee, poop, none of that. I don't want any of that. Just Grandpa Ben. I'm good with it. Uh, I want to bring you a greeting also from Northwest Church. Uh, we have such a wonderful church family. You guys sent us out four years ago, and everything is going uh, quite well. We're family with them. It's, it's an honor to, to be the lead pastor there. It's so many great people. Uh, I did bring a couple books with me in case there's a chance you don't have my books. Um, there are gifts out there in the foyer. Uh, feel free to grab one of those on your way out today. I don't want to talk much about them. I want to jump right into the Word because we have just a little bit of time and a lot uh, a, a long ways to go. So if you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 15. And as you do that, I am quite aware that Pastor Chris did a sermon series on the book of Luke and did cover this chapter. And so I, I realize that that has happened, but I want to uh, share my heart on this. I told Pastor Chris a couple of things that are in my heart these days that, that I feel like are right there. And I want to talk about things that are in my heart um, and, and not something that's kind of far out from where, where I'm at currently. And so this message is called God Loves the Prodigal from Luke chapter 15. Let's go ahead and pray as we open the word today. Father, we do thank you for your word. We agree with the psalmist that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And we declare today that we need your word. We, we absolutely need it. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate this passage and guide us into truth. And I ask for conviction conviction to believe your word, conviction to live out what your word says. So give us the grace to live out the words that we read today, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Really small amount of context here before we just read a bunch of this passage. In Luke chapter 14, 
There's quite a crowd that is, they've gathered around Jesus to follow him, to hear his teaching. So he turns around at this point, at the end of chapter 14, and he gives a challenging exhortation to those that are present. And he talks about the cost of discipleship. We might assume that this would turn people away. Sometimes when hard things are said, we tend to think if you say something hard, people are going to stop following. But actually, quite the opposite happens. The Bible says that sinners started to come and follow Jesus after he said the hard things. And so the religious leaders were present, and they were really upset that the sinners were coming to Jesus in droves. And so they began to complain about this. And in response to their grumbling, Jesus told three stories that we're very familiar with. He told the story about the lost sheep. He told the story about the lost coin. And the final one, which we'll focus on today, is called the prodigal son or the lost son. We're going to look at this story, and I'm going to start reading here in chapter 15 and verse 11 all the way to 31. You might have to breathe a couple times when we do it, but let's go ahead and read through this passage. It says here, verse 11, and he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to out the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me one as, uh, as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate." Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. You could underline that part. He was not willing to to go in. And his father came out to him and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Now, this is a familiar story. I bet you most of you know it. You've heard it. Maybe you've heard a sermon. Some of you probably preached it before. I bet movies are made from this story. But when we hear the word prodigal, which is where I want to focus today, we often think about somebody that we know or love, or maybe it was us at some point that, that has walked away from, from God. However, the word prodigal refers to this by definition, a person who wasted or squandered money, possessions, or resources. And so in this story, we often highlight the younger son because he's the one that wasted his father's inheritance. However, I want to say to you today that he's not the only prodigal in the story. In fact, I think there's two prodigals. And if you ask me, I think although the story is aimed at the religious leaders because they're grumbling and they're unhappy about, about the sinners gathering to Jesus, it's aimed at the religious leaders as the older brother. But the story is actually really about the love of the father. 
And so it's with that in mind, I want to do a couple things. First, I just want to bring up the characters, which are prodigal number one and prodigal number two. And then I want to land on simply talking about the great love of our God, if you'll allow me today. And so let's first look at prodigal number one, and let's call him the son who walked away. Jesus highlights the younger son as the one who clearly has a desire for dependence. He doesn't want to be under his father's roof. He doesn't want to listen to his father's rules. As far as he's concerned, his father's house is a prison, and he just wants the keys and to get freedom. You might want to call this rebellion. I want to do my own thing. I want to be my own person. I want to live my own life. Most of us were like this at some point. Some of us have a human in our house right now that acts like this, but we are not going to say amen today (laughs) because they could be sitting next to us. But we're all too familiar with this thing called rebellion, and Jesus describes the younger son with a lot of detail. And I know this is a story, and I know it's a parable to prompt a truth, but I'm going to milk the story for all it's worth because I think the detail here is is very important. And so here's a couple things that I think we want to point out from what Jesus describes as as the younger son. Number one, he wanted what the father had. In verse 12, it says, the son went to the father and says, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. Talk about entitlement. Give me the share. Now, we know this from history that family inheritance is not given until the father dies. And so this is an abnormal request. It's bold, it's disrespectful, and it reveals the true heart of the younger son. Either the son hated his father and didn't care if he was dead or he was simply an obstacle to what he wanted. I just want what you give to me. I want what you have for me. I'm not interested in the relationship. He wants his dad's stuff, but essentially he's saying in this request, your worth to me is what you give to me. And friends, isn't that how some people see God today? They see God not as the loving father that he is through his son, Jesus Christ, who gave absolutely everything for us. We never need another I love you from God because it's already given to us in Jesus Christ. If a person says to you or says to me, or if it's something you've ever felt in your heart, like, I don't feel God's love. Friends, look at the cross. That is the greatest I love you that we're ever going to get. It says, in this, God sent his son. His love for us is revealed in sending his son for us. But sometimes today we can get caught up in some type of Christian narrative that says, I literally am just out for what God can give for me. You know, we have that kind of Christianity today. It's like when I get into a jam, come on, I call on the lamb. (laughs) Don't laugh too loud. Somebody just woke up. You know, amen. I'm not judging, amen. I'm just nudging. There's a difference. There's a difference, Christian, all right? I don't know where the line is, but there is a difference. And so this is what it sounds like. I actually was talking to a guy outside of the church. It wasn't that long ago, and I was sharing the Lord with him. I shared my testimony. I shared the gospel with him just briefly. I didn't get to give him Genesis to Revelation or anything, but it was enough. And at the end of it, you know, I'm trying to like lead him to a place where maybe salvation is something that the Spirit of God is birthing in him. And so I'm asking him, is this something that you want to do, make a decision to follow Jesus with your life. And this is what he said to me, just like this. He said, well, Ben, if God just does this one thing for me, then I'll follow him. And that one thing, guys, isn't really appropriate to bring up today. It, 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 you know, it's just not even worth talking about, but it was sort of ridiculous. Basically, if God does this one thing for me, then I'll follow him. And the idea is that if God's God, then you follow him. I mean, if he's real, then we follow him. If he's God, God meaning he's over all of us, And so he just has this wrong concept of God and that God is out for me instead of me out for God. I'm supposed to serve him. He's not supposed to serve me, but this exists. And the young son wants what the father has, not who the father is. The second point is he wasted everything on nothing. Verse 13 says that he took the inheritance. He flew to Vegas. He quickly spent all of it on what it calls loose living. And in a short amount of time, he wastes everything on pleasurable experiences with nothing of true value left over. And that can be what happens, right? This picture illustrates how easy it is to give up on what really matters for temporary pleasure. That's so easy to do, isn't it? The older you get, the more you can say amen to that. You know, we see it in young people, but we really know it the older that we get. It's something that we can do too. You know, the older we get, what we do is we sophisticate sin. That's really all we do. We just sort of sophisticate it and act like it's not really there. We get better language for it. I didn't get any amen, so I'll just keep going. But I I feel like... (laughs) 
It'd be like, in this situation, it, it'd sort of be like trading the, the deed of your car over for a cold glass of lemonade on a 90 degree day. I mean, like, you, it sounds like a good idea because you're, let's say you're so thirsty and you drink the lemonade, you're like, oh, this is, here's the deed to my car, you drink the lemonade, the lemonade tastes so good, it feels so good, you're so refreshed, you're hydrated, kind of, got a lot of sugar in there, but you're feeling better than you did, but now all of a sudden when the lemonade's gone, you realize there's a problem that you don't have a car to drive home. And that's really what happens to the son here. He trades all this stuff in for this loose living, this pleasurable experience that's only temporary. And then at the end of it all, he realizes I've got nothing left over. Wow, it's a bad place to be. And, and this leads to my point three about the younger son is he was reduced down to rock bottom. Of course, Jesus kind of layers it on here and says, and there was a severe famine that took the region. He's trying to help us feel the story so there's limited jobs, and the younger son could only get one job, and that was to feed pigs. And as a young Jewish kosher man, he doesn't, he's not even supposed to go near pigs, let alone feed them, and desire to feed from the food that they're eating. This is not something a man like him is supposed to even be around, and yet he finds himself in the lowest of lows. And it illustrates that sin produces death at some point. Yes, we can get away with sin, but only so long. It will eventually produce death. And it's how prideful, this is how prideful we can be in our sin. Because here's what we find in this story. The young son can fall all the way to the bottom. And yet, isn't it amazing? It took him a while to finally look up. And here's part of the point with that is that you can hit rock bottom, but just because you're in the lowest of lows does not mean that you make the decision to turn up. There are so many people that are at rock bottom and they haven't yet turned. And God in his grace continues to draw us because that's how good God is. It's possible maybe that you're here today and you took a path. I mean, just because we're in church doesn't mean it hasn't happened to us before or isn't happening to us right now. You maybe took a path that promised one thing and delivered another and you find yourself in a place of bottom and you don't like it, you don't want it, but you're there. And the, the question is, are we turning up to look at God where we are right now? Because he's looking at us. He's always looking at us. He never leaves us. Our addictions will lead us to places that are very dark and our vain pursuits will lead us astray. They promise one thing, but they deliver something entirely different. And we lose family, we can lose respect, we can lose our purpose. And friends, listen, the people that our culture even follows today are screaming at us. They have the millions of dollars. They have the famous platforms. They've got all the social media following. And yet many of them are telling us, if not writing songs to us, to tell us that it isn't worth it. Oh, you don't believe me, so I'm going to prove it to you today. Billie Eilish, number one album in 2019, said in an interview, fame is trash. And that's the only part of it I can read to you today. <laughs> Justin Bieber, though, some of you guys like the Biebs. You know, he has obviously a number one, you know, amen, we're praying for you. All right, so <laughs> praying for him. You know, he's a confused individual. A lot of Christians like to say, oh, man, he's a Christian. And he fall this guy's really confused. He's got $250 million. But his Christianity is kind of like this, if you've ever listened to him. And I'm not judging him. I'm just saying, like, he's at the top of the top of his game, but here's what he says. Fame is unanticipated. I've no, or he says, I have a lot of money, clothes, cars, awards, and I'm still unfulfilled. And he said this in response to a song that he wrote called Lonely. And may I remind you that music is the language of the soul and often people are writing these lyrics because that's literally how they feel. Some people listen to that and they go, I resonate with Justin. I resonate with him. He's so amazing. That just speaks my soul. I don't know if anybody talks like that, but you know, in caricature form, that's me. I feel that in my heart. You know, he wrote that because that was his heart. He's really lonely. Money, fame, status. And you're like, a couple of you here today, and you're like, Biebs, Eilish, that's a young person's game, Pastor Ben. I'm not even into that. Well, what did Harrison Ford say? Because he's 80. And he said this about fame. It was unanticipated. I've never enjoyed it. He's 80. just doesn't care anymore. You can get the table you want in a restaurant, doctor's appointments before everyone else. But what's that worth? Nothing. 
And I'm not even saying this is rock bottom, but you can have all this stuff and a lack of the stuff doesn't mean you're at rock bottom. It's what happens on the inside of you that actually constitutes what that means. But by God's grace, he allows some of us to feel the bottom. Why? So that we can look up and see God. Because that's what we all really want and really need. And the last part is he attempted to pay his father back. Now listen carefully to this. In verse 17 and 19, he rehearses this speech to go back to his father, and then he ends up saying it to him, and he says, I have sinned against heaven and you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son, but why don't we have another arrangement instead of family relationship? Why don't we have this arrangement where I'm one of your hired servants? Another way of saying it is I'm an indentured servant. So I will work for my room and board because I'm no longer part of the family. So what I'll do is everything that I get from you, I'll pay it back by working it off as well. I mean, that sounds a lot like religious works, if you ever ask me. It's like, let's make a religious arrangement. That's where I think Jesus is going with this to help other people understand. There's something inside of us where we want to work it off before God because we feel so bad about the things that we've done. And so, hey, I'll come back to God. I'll come back to the Father. And then I'll just sort of work for it. Well, here's the problem. We can't pay God back. That's what grace is all about. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. The Father gives it freely and this is what we learn. God doesn't want us to pay him back. He just wants us to come back. That's all the father ever wanted. Well, he's not the only prodigal, amen. He's just not. So we got to pick on the older son. So this is prodigal number two, the son who stayed at home. The father received the younger son, restored him by th throwing this extravagant party. In verse 25, it says, the older brother was in the field and he heard the music, probably Justin Bieber, Chris said, amen, I don't know where I'm at, you know, amen, I don't. He heard the music, he saw or heard the dancing, and he asked the servant, what in the world's going on in there? And the servant says, your brother's come home. See, the servant's excited. Your brother's at home, and your father's received him back safe and sound. Isn't that exciting? And the brother was furious. And here's what the, his response can tell us. He may have stayed, but he still strayed. Come on, that rhymed, Pastor Chris. He may have stayed, but he still strayed in his heart. The older son was a prodigal of a different kind, completely unlike his father in character and attitude. And so here's a couple things about him that we want to bring up today. Number one, he was angry at his father for how he responded to his brother. In verse 28, it says he was so angry. Look at this. I am not even willing to go inside. And it's, it's ironic to me that the next passage says to us, the father had to go outside to plead with him. He has to go outside to the younger brother. He has to go outside to the older brother. I hope you see it, but both of them are prodigals as far as I can tell. The older brother made a case for the father giving undeserved special or better treatment to his brother. You treated him unfairly in comparison to me. He doesn't deserve this. You know where I'm going. He didn't earn this. He squandered this. This is not fair. I deserve more. But can you recognize this today? He had more. But the older brother didn't just want more. He didn't want his brother to experience grace and mercy. Do you relate to the older brother today? Have you ever, have you ever thought, I was in church. I tried to do good. I served. And others who ran off in selfish, sinful living came back. They went from crack and they came on back and they got this amazing testimony and they get the special treatment. Pastor Chris gave them the microphone. They've got favor and gifts of the spirit, wrote a book. <laughs> and here I am, just good old faithful, Always been here. I've been in church the whole time. I was serving in children's ministry. Pastor Chris said, we're going to fast. And I was the first one signing up. And you just walk all over me. And all these people that have this story get to come back and, and they're better than I am. I, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to put words into your mouth today that you've ever, you know, felt that way. But if the shoe fits, you know, amen. <laughs> if it fits, you might want to think about that today. The older brother despised the grace and the mercy of the father, but in so doing, he resisted replicating his character. The second point is he despised his brother for the decisions that he made. In verse 29 and 30, the older brother uses comparison to build himself up and pull his brother down. He wasn't even willing to call him his brother, so he says to the father, this son of yours. I'm not even going to identify him as a family member. 
He doesn't want his brother back because he doesn't love him and he doesn't really care about him. And it reveals this. And please, if you have a pen, write this down. It reveals that loveless religion stings just as bad as religious or rebellious living. Loveless religion stings just as bad as rebellious living. And in some cases, probably worse. So no matter what way we turn, friends, we are still prodigals, whatever path that we take. The, the third point is this. He wanted, the fa- he wanted what the father had, but not what the father was, which is entirely like his, his brother. It's amazing how the older son forgot that the father gave him an even greater inheritance because the firstborn would get two-thirds and the next in line would get one-third. I mean, throw all of that historical significance out, right? This is what he's doing. He's like, this is entitlement at an even greater measure. It looks really bad in the story when the young son comes to him and says, give me my share of the inheritance. But it's even worse when the older son has more than the younger son and basically is saying that, The younger brother should never have gotten any of it. Jesus used this story to show the religious leaders that they forgot the heart of God in their pursuit of God. It can happen. The older brother had a lot in common with the younger brother. Both of them wanted what the father had or what the father could do for them, but they missed the most important part, which is to have a vibrant and meaningful relationship with their father. To live in the Father's house and resent his grace and resist his character is not living at all. And I would tell you this today, that some people are alive, but they're not living. Real living is to not only receive the grace of God, but walk in it in such a way where it flows out of you as well. See, what it says, freely you have received, so freely you shall give. And true freedom is not just what we get from God that liberates us, but that it gets so down into us that it comes out of us like a river. It's just first nature. That's real freedom. If we receive something from God and it doesn't come out of our life, we're still bound. Because that's just the feeling that remains inside of us without any transformation. That's real freedom. If we receive forgiveness, if we receive grace, if we receive mercy and it stays with us, thank you, Lord. I really wanted that. Thank you, Lord. I really needed that. But it doesn't actually flow out and touch other people. We are still bound. And this is what a story like this can say to us right in our face and But, you know, today I really want to focus the rest of our few moments that we have together on what I think is the most important part of this story, or at least it is in this season of my life, and that is the father who loved them both. As we dig into this, I think the main character actually is the father. We look at the brothers, but it's the father. And I wanted to show you one of Christian history's most famous paintings. It's, It's a Rembrandt, and it's called Return of the prodigal son. So if you could throw those pictures up here, there's, there's two paintings that you're going to see here. But this one right here um, that you'll see, this is the one that we probably all know. Now, if you can't see it, I think it's up on the screen. So the one that's on my left-hand side, this one's called The Return of the Prodigal Son. Not everybody knows that Rembrandt, 30 years before he painted this, actually did a prior painting where the prodigal son is in the brothel ha- having a good old time living, living it up. So he actually did two paintings. But the second version, which he did at the end of his life, is very, very different. You can see that it's dark. Its colors are muted. You can kind of feel the brokenness in it of the prodigal. The focal point, though, is actually look at the face of the father. That's where the light is shining. Do you notice that? And historians tell us that this was on purpose. Because Rembrandt, before he died in this painting, he wanted to show the compassion of the father. And that was the purpose of him redoing this painting, is that he had had a revolutionary revelation himself. The first painting focused on the son, the second on the father. It's intentional. And that's the revelation that I want to talk about a little bit more today. Number one, when we talk about the father, I want to say this. God loves us even when we walk away. Can I get an amen? Come on, come on. God loves us even when we walk away. It broke the father's heart when his son demanded his inheritance and he walked away. Uh, But maybe you walked away from God, if not physically, maybe in your heart. And you need to know, we need to know, that God never stops loving us. Isn't that true? God never stops loving us. It's just not in his nature. Even at our lowest points, he's always calling us home. That's that voice we hear. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit calling us, drawing us. 
I had this woman one time came to our church. It was maybe six months ago. And I preached through all these stories. Actually, I've preached a lot on prodigals. And it's a passion of mine at this point because we've lost so many in Christianity. A lot of people have, uh, they're experts on the deconstruction movement. I don't want to be an expert on the deconstruction movement. I want to be an expert on the love of the Father. Because I believe it's the love of the Father that draws them back. So when I hear all these experts talking about how many are deconstructing, I want to know what the solution is. And I'll tell you what the solution is. It's finding something that's worth giving everything for. And that is the love of God. And maybe it is that in our technicality, we've lost the passionate love of God. We see it in Christ, but we have to understand that a God like this does not leave us or forsake us. This woman heard me preaching about prodigals. I was talking about our family and friends that have walked away from the Lord. She's sitting in the back. I didn't even see her, to be honest with you. The lights were, were dim. She comes up after the service and she goes, that's me. The first thing out of her mouth, that's me. I said, what, what do you mean that's you? Because my sermons are long. You know, so there's a lot there. <laughs> you know, can we clarify for a moment which part? Because that could be bad. She said, that's me. I'm a prodigal. So what do you mean? And she talked about how for years, she hadn't been to church for like 12 years and her whole life's changed. She's a single mom now and she's just been up and down and this and that and everything else. I'm a prodigal. I said, well, isn't it a wonderful thing that today you might say you're a prodigal, but you've come home and that can change right here and right now. And so we prayed and she gave her heart to the Lord Jesus because the gospel is true for her like it's true for me. And in a moment, everything can change. Isn't that an amazing thing today? And it changed for her that day. She once was lost, but now she's found. I don't even know how she made it to our church. She had never been to our church before. It had been 12 years since she had ever been to a church what she didn't know is that we started praying for prodigals and we've had this pursuit of doing so and, and it, so it's very easy to talk about it for me because I've watched the Lord just change so many hearts, ter turn their hearts back to him. Number two is God loves us even when we wander or squander. Maybe today you're here and you're wandering in some darkness right now and your life has not gone the way that you wanted it to or thought it would. And shame is such a powerful barrier between where we are and where we know we need to be. But it's all it is is shame and it can be broken because the grace and the mercy and the love of God is like the detonator on that stronghold and it'll just blow it up and cause that wall to come down just as fast as we pray that prayer. I got good news for you today that we may live in a cancel culture, but God is not a part of it. And no matter what you've said or what you've done, he doesn't cancel you. He doesn't cancel me. He loves us just the same. He doesn't love our behavior. He doesn't like it when we sin. He doesn't want us to stay there. He hates, he, do, he wants us to change more than we ever want to change because he wants that relationship with us that's on the other side of it. The third point is God loves us even when we have a hardened heart. Maybe we're like the older brother. We lost our desire to be like God. And maybe we've lost our desire to love people. Maybe we've lost our desire to go after everyone. We see it in God, but we don't see it in us. And I want to tell you, God can change that. God can change that. That is Christianity, by the way. It's that we also join what God is already doing to seek and save the lost. If Christianity isn't about that, then what's it about? It's to join God in what he's already doing. We're not doing anything for God. We're simply joining him in what he's already about. And so whatever we see in the Father, whatever we see in Jesus, that's what we're joining today. That's Christianity and nothing less. I know it's become a lot of other things, but certainly this at its base level is what it's about. We may have stayed, but, but we maybe didn't pray. And maybe we've served and we're in the house and we're trying to do our best, but we've lost something in our heart and God wants to revive that. God wants to bring us back to what he's intended for us to be, to walk in the same nature that he created us in. Number four is God loves us enough to call us to change. Coming home for the younger brother meant becoming who he was born to be. And he had to change to come back into his father's house. Repentance is still important, isn't it? I know it's popular today to say that God is love, but love is not God, guys. <laughs> God defines love. God welcomes us home. But when we walk through the door, we've got to change to conform to him and not ask him to conform to us. And that's the part of Christianity that we have to own, and that's humility. 
God, I'm sorry, forgive me, cleanse me from unrighteousness as we walk into the door. We humble ourselves. The Bible says that he gives grace to the humble. He's waiting for us to humble ourselves. And that's what the younger son had to do. But for the older brother, coming home meant to become like his father and to be willing to value the same things that his father valued and not just be entitled to what he thinks he deserves. God calls us to change because he made us. He's shaping us. He will not leave us where we are. Aren't you grateful for that today? His change in our life is not a lack of his acceptance. It's his unwillingness to allow us to accept less than his best. He made us. He knows what that looks like. And then lastly, I just want to say this before I close. God loves us enough to welcome us all home. You know my favorite part of the story? It's where the younger brother makes a decision to turn towards home and he's walking and it says the father sees him and Jesus uses this terminology. He's a long way off. And this old man, which is undignified at best, hikes up or girds himself or whatever they had to do with a robe. I am not familiar with that. But he must have had to gird himself and start running towards his son. You know what it tells me about God? It's that if we even look in his direction, he's so full of rescue that he starts to run towards us. That's what God is like. His heart is so full of rescue that if we just look in his direction, man, he's right there. And that's good news for me. That's good news for you. In our church, I was walking in our um, we have a huge storage room. It's actually the size of this sanctuary, believe it or not, downstairs in our church. And I saw these boxes. They used to be our benevolence boxes. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, pick that up and bring it upstairs. And that's sort of a weird thing. And, and wouldn't you know that as I'm walking upstairs with this large box, it's about this tall, I'm walking upstairs and one of our pastors sees me and he goes, what are you doing? And I actually don't know. This is the truth. I don't know. I'm just doing what, and what are you going to say? The Holy Spirit told me to bring up this box. So of course I didn't tell him that. I said, well, I'm just bringing this into the sanctuary. And I said, why don't you go get the other one? Cause we had two of them. And he said, okay, cause misery loves company and he's my buddy. So pastor Scott's preaching at our church right now. He's a good friend. Um, so he goes and grabs the other one. And uh, I sat right here in the steps of our of our platform, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking to me about prodigals. And it was like this, this weekend, what I want you to do is put these boxes up on the stage, and I want you to ask everybody in the congregation to write on the connect card, and I want you to ask them to write names of prodigals. See, if you're not one, you know one. I want you to write names of prodigals, and I want you to come up after the service, and I want you to put those connect cards in the boxes. And I did that, that weekend. I put them on the stage, right in front of everybody. And I told them, we're not giving up on anybody. If they've walked away, that isn't the final story. And so let's pray. So we prayed that weekend and I watched hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people walk up with cards, with multiple names on those cards. We were so overwhelmed, we actually started putting them on the steps and the steps were covered with cards. People were crying as they walked up because they have sons and they have daughters and they have moms and they have dads who have walked away from Jesus. And it was like that moment in the gospels where it says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. That's how I felt. I felt the grief of God. He weeps, not just at the sin of the world, but at what's available in the midst of the sin, this radical grace, which is the real solution. So we collected all those names and we have over 3,000 names that we're praying for now. And we call it prodigal prayer. And I wanted to say that, um, so we have a fast, we, we, we stumbled into all this, right? It wasn't like, hey, let's strategize guys of what we're gonna do. No, the Holy Spirit said, pick up that box and bring it upstairs. So now we painted the boxes. We have a huge sign on them. It says prodigal prayer and they're up front. When you come to our church, they're right there. Every weekend, every other weekend, people are put, we actually have little cards that says prodigal prayer. People are putting new names in boxes. But here's the miracle is that as we're fasting and as we're praying and as we're taking this scripture and we're seeing the heart of the Father, here's what we're finding is that we're praying that God would send back to his kids that were in our youth group kids that were young adults and they got offended, they got wounded, they got hurt, or maybe they just ran out in rebellious living. We're saying, God, send them back. 
We're asking God to send them back. We have put a stake in the ground and we're saying, God, it says in the word that you don't leave or forsake. You don't leave us to our own vices and send them back. And guess what? Slowly but surely, not in mass droves, there's not massive amounts of people, but one after another, we're getting testimony after testimony that God's sending them back. And maybe you today, you have someone in your family. And I'll tell you what happens when you have a prodigal because I actually know. You start to lose your heart in prayer. You grieve still and you want them to come back, but you don't know what to do and you feel helpless. And I'll tell you, when we feel helpless, it is not hopeless. God knows what to do. And the gospel of Jesus still works. Prayer is still powerful and God is still answering by bringing them home. And let me just tell you, as somebody who was a prodigal, both the younger and the older, God's still bringing the prodigal home. And so that's what I'd like to, to do today. Would you allow me to pray with you that the Lord would touch our hearts today? And if you would, wouldn't mind, just bow your heads for a moment as we have a word of prayer. And let me just say this to you. If you're here today and man, maybe you are a prodigal. I just don't want to assume anything. Maybe you've walked away. I don't know if anybody knows it. Um, half of you I don't know I certainly respect you and I'm glad that we're here together today but we can't talk about the radical grace of God with just out asking the question do you need an encounter with Jesus where you give your heart to him all you have to do is surrender it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or what you've said all you have to do is surrender and his love will receive you right where you are and give you everything you need but surrender is just that it's God, I give you my life. He may not fix everything in our life that we need fixed right now, but he'll fix our heart. He can do that, and that is a miracle. He's the only one that can. And so today, if you're here and you need to give your life to Jesus, you need to turn your life over to him, I just simply want you to raise your hand, and I want to see it. just want to give you that opportunity today. You say, Pastor Ben, I need to give my life to Jesus. I'm, I've walked away, and I need to come back. If that's you, just raise your hand, be bold about it. I want to see that hand and pray for you. Okay. Yeah. Is there anybody else today? There's two of you. I'm going to pray for you. There's three of you today. Is there anybody else? I just want to be sensitive. We just thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. And we just want what you want. God, you're worthy of of all of our heart and our life. And so I thank you for these three in this room today. Father, I pray you would bless them, lead them to the place of everlasting, where the surrender of their heart is giving themselves fully and completely to you. Tell them what that means through your word. We pray for that change, that transformation in them. If you raise your hand, I wanna ask you after the service to come receive prayer. I wanna ask you to come up front and talk to Pastor Chris and Jen or somebody here and receive prayer. But the rest of you, would you stand? Pastor Chris, if you would come, I know you're going to close the service, but will you let me pray? And would you join me in prayer as we pray for prodigals in our life today? Could we do that? So let's lift our hands to the Lord on behalf of all the prodigals that we know and that we love, people that we love in our life. And I want to say this to you, please just hear my heart. When it was like last year at some point when the Lord gave us this commission and this initiative to pray for the prodigals, it's become a part of our heart. It's become a part of it's become a part of my life. Some of you have prodigals. I want to ask you, let's not give up. Let's not give. God never gives up. All we're doing is joining him. He doesn't give up. I don't care how far away that they are. I was really far away. Some of you were really far away and God brought you all the way back. So let's pray with the same faith that brought us home. Let's pray that they come home. Would you do that with me today? Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Today we stand as your people and many of us, we stand today with the testimony that you brought us home. And so, God, we acknowledge that. We thank you for your work in our lives. And we ask you on behalf of our sons and our daughters, our moms and our dads, no matter how far they've gone, we ask, Lord, that you would bring them home. Many that have grown up in this church, and if they walked away, Lord, we ask you to bring them back. We pray for a supernatural encounter with the Holy Spirit to reveal the person of Jesus. You're so good, and your gospel is so true, and you're still at work. You're convicting, you're leading, you're revealing. And we ask you, Lord, even more, would you do it? 
Would you encounter our loved ones? And Lord, would you also commit us to whatever we need to do? It's not on us, but we're partnering with you. So help us to do what you're asking us to as we walk this out together in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for having me today.